que, bueno, vamos a escuchar, como les decía, la presentación que nos dio Cheryl Connolly, que es la directora de Global Consumer Trends and Futuring eh, para Ford Motor Company. So good morning all. I want to begin by welcoming you to Dearborn and welcoming those who are watching uh, our, our live stream of our first, second annual trend book um, through our partners at Cool Hunting. So I'd love to uh, talk about the work they do with Ford because I feel like I have the greatest job in the company. I never look at the automotive industry. I don't talk about cars. My job is to look at social, technological, economic, environmental, and political arenas to try to understand What are the forces that are shaping the face of consumer demand? And this is an age-old question. In fact, Henry Ford had said back in 1914, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. This problem continues to daunt us today. It takes us three years to bring a vehicle to market. And if we were to ask each of you, what can we build three years from now that's going to make your life easier, that's going to be cutting edge and innovative, most of us would say, I don't know what's going to make my life easier three weeks, three months from now. So three years is really daunting. So one of the tools we use from a future standpoint is trends. We try to understand what are the things that are going to shape our values, our attitudes, and behaviors. Now, I've been lucky enough to talk about this work for almost a decade. And those of you who've heard me talk about it before, I often say that trends don't change. They're slow moving. We're looking for things that are deep rooted. So it takes a long time for a trend to manifest itself. Those are what we call macro trends. What you're sharing with you today are a collection of micro trends. And the name suggests that they have a shorter shelf life, but they're still significant. They still offer extraordinary insight into the world around us. What's different from the book that we launched last year is that this is the first year that we took it global. And that made it even more challenging because the trends may be universal, but the way that they play out region to region vary. And what we encountered was a lot of contradictions, a lot of tensions. So as you look at the book, the collection of 10 micro trends for 2014, we hope that you'll take note that there are inherent tensions. There's a spectrum of viewpoints that touch these attitudes, the values that we see playing out. So I'm going to take you through the 10 trends that we have. The first of which is called the quiet riot of innovation. And I want you to consider for a moment that the iPad has been in the marketplace for about four years. And I imagine that about half of you, if not three quarters of you, own an iPad. We can't imagine what our life was like before that. They're widespread in schools today. And this type of innovation enters the marketplace each and every day. And we're surrounded by it so much to the point that we've become immune or numb to how disruptive how seismic the changes are when technology changes our life that way. But against that backdrop, we also see people that are uncomfortable with all the change, the rapid pace of technology, the global economy that makes the uh, marketplace even more vulnerable, we have political instability. Many of us long for a quieter, gentler time. That's what we call old school. The idea that things that remind us of the past take us back to a time when things were seemingly simpler, more gentler, more easily controlled. Our third trend that will be focused on in this book is called Meaningful versus the Middleman. In today's marketplace, we have these giant conglomerates that are bringing products to the marketplace, but we've lost the human touch. We've lost that emotional connection that makes the things, the products, the services, the experiences that we buy meaningful. And so more and more often, we're looking for people to reconnect to those connections. Companies like Etsy remind us that we can get right in touch with the people who crafted these goods, and they tell you the story, the history behind it. The fourth trend is called statusphere. Worldwide, we see people entering the consuming class, the middle class is rising, and the way that we project our status varies from region to region. It has context according to how mature that market is in terms of the consuming class. Sometimes wealth whispers, other times it shouts trying to understand the differences. Vying for validation, anyone who's on Facebook knows the rush that we get when we get someone to like our ideas, our thoughts, our pictures, our concepts on that platform, and it's reinforcing. And we continue to seek out validation from strangers, people that we may never meet, we may never know um, in a face-to-face -face meeting, but their affirmation of what we do and how we see the world is almost addictive. This calls into question about how we spend our time, what we value, and that's where we got into the tension between the fear of missing out and the joy of missing out. 
these two things are, are propelled by social media, but that's not the only thing that's driving it. We have unlimited choice in the marketplace of where, when, and how we spend our time are constantly under question. We're wondering, did I make the right decision? Is this the best party? Is this the best media event in the marketplace today? And of course the answer is yes. <laughs> But social media puts a stream in front of us and says, is there something better going on? Should I, be, should I have made a different decision? It questions our judgment. But there's a backlash against that, and that's the joy of missing out. People are embracing the peace, the content, the inner sanctuary of disconnecting, letting go of all those choices, being content with the decisions that you make, and remaining focused on the thing that you have in front of you. The next trend, closely tied to that, is the myth of multitasking. I think one of the greatest pieces of propaganda today was that all of these handheld digital devices that were sold to us were sold to us on the premise that they would save us time. But instead they suck up all of our time. They blur the boundaries between professional life and personal life. And so how we spend our time becomes more and more taxing so that we try to manage multiple things at once. We become very accustomed to giving constant partial attention to the world around us. But few of us notice that this is taking a toll. It's taking a toll on our efficiency, our productivity, our effectiveness, but probably most importantly, it's taking a toll on our emotional relationships, the fulfillment that we get from these engagements. <coughs> Female Frontier is one of my favorite trends that we'll be talking about today. Um, we see women having improved access to education, leading to greater career opportunities, more financial independence. Marriage is no longer a requirement for financial security in a woman's world. And this has changed the landscape in dramatic ways. Historically, we've always talked about this in the context of emerging countries, third world countries, underdeveloped markets, and how that's changing. But even in the US, this becomes more and more pressing. As we look at college enrollments, we see more female students than male students. More women are getting degrees in bachelor's, master's, and PhDs. And even the recent recession, many pundits will refer to as the he session, because the jobs that were lost came from industries dominated by men. And as the economy recovers, there are jobs that are coming from industries dominated by women. The last trend that we touch upon in our book is called the sustainability blues. For many years, we've been talking about getting on the green bandwagon, doing all that we can to be sustainable, reduce our carbon footprint. But the sustainability blues highlights that maybe green isn't the issue. Blue is a much more pressing concern. And a population of 7 billion people worldwide, over a billion people do not have access to regular, clean drinking water. 15 million children die each year from waterborne diseases. This is one of the issues that hasn't reached the individual conscious level, but certain organizations, nonprofit and profit organizations, are collaborating to try to look for solutions before the problem becomes acute. One of the best parts of my job, though, is as I get to do this research and I'm looking outside the automotive industry, is I get to partner with thought leaders. Eh, y bueno, ahí la conferencia continuó durante más de una hora, así que es imposible poderles traer todo lo que estuvo, eh, estuvo exponiendo ahí en, esta, en la conferencia Cheryl O'Connell. Eh, Connelly, perdón, Cheryl O'Connell de Ford Motor Company. Así que les recomiendo que visiten la página de Ford Motor Company, for, for, uh, FordUSA.com o Ford.com uh, Ford para que vean todo lo que está haciendo Ford en este, en este año con esta conferencia que se llama Trends 2014, Ford Trends 2014, y realmente muy interesante porque como les decía y pudieron escuchar ahí, eh, se están, eh, Ford se está enfocando aquí muy inteligentemente en eh, las cosas en las que estamos eh, haciendo todos los seres humanos alrededor del mundo, ya no solamente acá en Estados Unidos, las cosas que nos interesan, las, los gustos que tenemos, eh, cómo nos relacionamos con las personas, cómo vamos a trabajar y todo esto. Así que muy, muy interesante la conferencia Ford Trends 2014. Y cuando regresemos vamos a hablar con Álvaro Cabal, el representante de los medios hispanos en Estados Unidos, que nos va a hablar sobre lo que fue el 2013 y lo que viene el 2014 para Ford Motor Company. Este programa fue una producción de National Latino Broadcasting.